Thank you. Regional Services Okay. Okay, Hori Mai and welcome to the Regional Services Committee uh, meeting. Um, we've got uh, apologies, anybody? Welcome, Peter. Um, <laughs> we're, we're just waiting for you to turn and come anyway, so no problems. <laughs> um, I've got Stuart and Estelle and Eric. I see David's here, so is any other apologies? Is Lyndall there? Uh, yeah, Lyndall's not here. I know she's isolating at the moment, so. But look, I'll, I'll um, if someone can move those apologies for accepted. Oh. Mm -hmm. Lloyd, and second, Nicole, all in favour say aye. Aye. Against carried. Uh, I don't think there's any declarations of interest I know of. No public forum. Um, we can go to the confirmation of the minutes on the 17th February, if someone can. Give us approval for those. Move that they be accepted. Right. Lord, someone second it. Yeah, I can do that. Two Lords. Um, any discussion on there? No, we're all good. Um, no. Not, I just wondered, Mr. Chairman, whether we should, for the matter of correctness, update the meeting on the Waituna land purchase um, at some stage. Yeah, we not really maybe want to. It's mentioned in the minutes here there was going to be some work done on that's moved along quite a lot now. Right. Uh, yep, where would you, would you want to talk? Just looking at the agenda in regards to where you. Well, do you want to have a bit of a talk? Well, it's in now. Yeah. We're in the reports. Okay, I'll, if you want to give us a report on that, where are the. Sorry. Oh, yep. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, well, if someone wants to move, we've got movement and second hand. Yep. All in favour of say aye. Aye. Against, carry. All right. This would be good if anybody has uh, any reports. Do you want to give us a rundown yeah, on that? I noticed that in the minutes there was going to be quite a discussion um, happening about the Tainariga block down at Waituna. Um, that has now moved to the point where. Um, a successful process has uh, been is in the process of being completed with the help of a finance team. Um, we discussed at length where the ownership of that property would be, and it's going to be sit with the Tiwatara Trust under their program, and um, they will come back to the Whakamana Tiwatara Trust with a, a working plan on how it fits into the greater work of the Waituna um, catchment. So. Um, It'd be fair to say that it was a tender process. Uh, we weren't the highest tender, um, but in saying that, we aligned our approach with Tony's wishes. Tony is very ill, as many know, and he wanted it settled before he was not able to carry out the transaction. So um, I think it was successful all round. We were pretty happy about it. I think he's happy that his educational um, Land area there has actually been carried on in the format that he set up. So that was the key point there. Through you, Mr. Chairman, can I just ask, is that, is that the bit on um, White Pine? White Pine Road, Road where the Road White Pine stands. There's a pond in here. There's a, pond in here yeah, there's a wetland yeah. educational trust been sure. over that for some time at boundaries yeah. of Waituna. Yep. Um, yep. That's, well, that's the block of land, it's off White Pine Road on the left. Sure. At some stage, it might be. Good to have a, um, a map that shows the sort of outline of all the land that belongs to the, you know, the trusts and things like that, just to sort of get an idea of what the ownership is in the vicinity of. Uh, can the can I suggest it's actually bigger than that? Well, we yeah. should actually bring a paper to council yeah. with not only the with the multiple ownerships of land that yeah. fit under the Whakamata Te Waituna program yeah, yeah. and some of the drivers and, and what is happening. We've got about a year and a half to run in that program and as soon as that's done we probably get Fiona to come through with a this is what it looks like between now and the end of this program because okay. at some stage we'll have a council discussion around what happens after this program finishes because we've contracted up effectively for this uh, five year period is going to end up being six because we sort of had a half a year chucked in there. And um, there's been government money in there and there's been other trusts formed. So it'd be good to have a real catch up and maybe a bit of forward thinking through that discussion as well. But you know, your point's valid, not everybody around the table knows 
what right. land is where and where it sits. Can you take a note of that? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. and I've, I know between um, through you, Chair, through Nick and uh, Nick Perm, if you are, I think that's, that's a report we can bring through quite easily. Okay. Um, Nick, what did you well, want to uh, just following on from that, um, that, that land was seen as a strategic pur pur uh, purchase. We're trying to um, do a, a proof of concept on the ability for constructed wetlands and, and sediment traps to significantly reduce the sediment and nutrient loads in waterways. The one that is likely to go ahead is on, on Currens Creek, which is a small, a smaller catchment. That'll do the proof of concept, but in the future, if we could secure more money, we may be able to do a, do a much larger one, which would have a direct effect on the um, on, on what's actually entering the lagoon. So that's that's quite an exciting um, process going forward. The other issue with what uh, Roy and Big Lord's just raised, possibly runs into the next item, is actually we probably need to do a bit of a have a report on at least land per se, and possibly some, some land there that should, should actually be included in the least land portfolio, which doesn't seem to show up at the moment. But also going forward, we probably need to be identifying areas, and we'd have to give leaseholders uh, plenty of warning. Uh, other areas where lease land that we may want to do something different in the future, whether it's um, fencing off native, whether it's wetlands, whether it's even, com even commercial plantings, is, you know, this, this is a long-term view, but I think we probably need, we probably need to start uh, that conversation. Yeah. Uh, Peter. Thanks, Mr Chairman. I'll just pick up on what Chairman Carl um, said. Really good idea. Those discussions need to happen. We're going around the province telling everybody what they need to be doing. Uh, we need to be looking at what we need to be doing too. Probably the land the, the yeah, obviously we probably should be discussing that for item one, the <laughs> least land management policy. But um, no, no, it's all good. Thanks, thanks for that. I'm really taking those notes down anyway. Um, I've actually skipped a couple of numbers, but uh, they were supplementary reports. But uh, is there any questions? Nobody's. That's a question you probably had. But uh, and then we've had reports. So we have any supplementary reports or extraordinary and urgent business? None that I know of. I'm sort of skipping around here, sorry. Getting back on track. Right, we'll get to number nine and item one. And in regards to lease land management policy and adjustment on the wording. Are you, do, are, you, are you expecting to talk or? It's a, it's a simple one. It's pretty straightforward. Yeah. Who has left the building? I think it's reasonably. <laughs> I think it's. Like, it's afternoon. pretty self-explanatory. I think anyway. it's pretty pretty self-explanatory. There was the request, I think, from the um, Ready Catchment uh, Committee that um, that uh, amendment should have been made at the time, and it was an oversight that it wasn't. So it's just really to uh, put the policy past you with that. Amendment in and ask that you um, agree to the change. Yep, no, that's pretty straightforward. I don't think it'll be too much discussion. I'm happy to move that. Good. Or do you want to? Well, I'm just clarifying because I yep. read that the, 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 the pink and five red yep. was being removed. Is that no, correct? No, it's added. Is it? Because on here, it's been added. The red it's added. It's added. Added. Oh, it's deleted a comma. Okay. Yeah, it's a yeah. deleted a comma. Yeah. Don't worry, I looked at yeah. that too. <laughs> I thought they will get them going if we yeah. delete that. So, no. no, I'm happy to move it, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, someone want to second that? Happy to second it. Um, just a brief comment. I think it's quite good to have this, this paper, and there's been quite, quite a bit of work done to get to the stage. But before we can have the conversation that we've just had, we need yeah. to understand the objectives. Um, of our lease land portfolio and have that in front of mind because we're going to make changes. You know, we do need, need to have to realise the, pri the primary um, use of it was flood management uh, and, and, and those sort of things need to be taken into consideration when we, we look at changes to the land. So it's good to see this report and I think that's a good basis to go forward on. Yeah, I know. I think having the policy thing in place gives us options to certainly tease those uh, future uses out. No more discussion. I have to put that uh, vote. All in favour say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Couldn't check on the screen. 
All right, we'll move on to item two, the biosecurity and biodiversity is who's through, through you, Chair, I think. Um, items um, items two and three may may follow swiftly after each other's two pres uh, one presentation and uh, two topics. So I think we're starting with Ali. Ali. Welcome. Yep. Thank, oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can I just check, is there anyone in the room that's going to run the PowerPoint or am I running it for everybody? Um, if, if you can run it, Ali, that would be helpful. Okay. It's quite a big file, and I'm on rural broadband, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see how we go. But. Okay. Hopefully, everyone can see that. Okay. Um, so yeah, as Paul said, we're going to do um, item two and three together, and try and do a bit of a joint presentation for bio and catchment integration. Um, and unfortunately, Fiona's away today, so um, we've got some of her team to present for her. Um, there's actually, there's three things we're going to cover. We're going to cover um, updates from both teams, but then also the joint customer service survey that we did earlier in the year. We're going to give a quick overview on that and some of the results that came out. So in terms of biosecurity, biodiversity, last time we updated to regional services, we focused on animal pests and plant pests. So this time we're going to focus on the other bit of our programs, which is partnerships, marine biosecurity and biodiversity. Um, there's a lot of crossover with Jobs for Nature in this space, and Jobs for Nature were reported in detail up to OPAC. So we're going to try and focus on the business as usual, but you will see a little bit of things coming through as well, because it's impossible to unpick the two of them. So just quickly on the partnerships, um, there has been a lot going on this year, despite the issues with COVID and trying to get together. Um, really positive and exciting things happening in the predatory rakiura space. You'll know that we've now got Rob Phillips set up on the Tipuka Rakiura Trust, um, and they have managed to employ a project director. Um, we're also going to continue to be involved in that partnership on the advisory and engagement group. So we're going to have two different links into that project now, fully supported by the biosecurity team. And I think you're going to start seeing a lot more happening in that space over the next 12 months to five years with potential trials the feasibility work happening on the island to see how feasible that project is. So it's really good. Um, the other thing that's been happening is that Environment Southland still holds a space on the Bonamia Governance Group. Um, so that's the marine pest which got into the oyster farms um, in Big Glory Bay in 2019. Um, the project and the management of that is being run by Biosecurity New Zealand or MPI. Um, and they have just put out a paper for consultation um, so we're now working with them on long-term management of that pest and we'll be presenting a paper back to council at some point soon with some recommendations for our submission on that. Other projects that you might not have heard much about recently is we're still supporting the TAR work that the Department of Conservation do. So we provide funding to help with the aerial surveys and that's going ahead this month. We're hoping that nothing will get found. We are continuing to support the velvet leaf response as well, which again is led by MPI. Um, and there's been surveys with um, dogs sniffing out um, velvet leaf. And again, we haven't found anything. So it's looking really positive that the eradication effort that went into that back in 2016 has been successful. Um, and check clean dry, we're continuing to fund that. Um, it's being run by Fish and Game and they're focusing on advocacy. They've been replacing all of the signage and cleaning stations, and they're saying they're getting really good compliance on that this summer, with particularly cleaning gear between waterways. Um, the biodiversity space, Biodiversity Southland, is the big forum that we um, set up. We try and run them four times a year. Um, that's been really tricky this year, so we are behind on that. We're gonna try and focus on that over the winter to try and make sure we can bring all the parties that work on biodiversity together. But we have managed to help CERN, the Southland Ecological Restoration Network, um, complete a successful field trip back in spring. And there is another field trip happening this weekend, um, which brings normally 30, 40 people together from across the region looking at different biodiversity objectives. Just a really quick touch on our partnerships. Um, I'm now going to pass you over to Catherine to talk in a little bit more detail about the Marine Biosecurity Programme. Thanks, Ellie, and kia ora koutou. It's, um, this is my first time presenting to Council in my new role. Um, 
hopefully some of you will recognize me from my previous position in the policy and planning team uh, where I worked on the coastal plan review. So really excited today to just come along and give you a bit of an update um, on some of the programs and reports uh, projects we have going in the marine space. Um, first off, I'll just touch on the marine compliance. So we undertake two multi-agency trips at least a year. Um, there was a cancellation in February with the first one due to COVID related issues with the Department of Conservation. But we managed to undertake a trip in April 22. So that was myself that went along with Jen from Biosecurity New Zealand and one of our Jobs for Nature um, touched on all the biosecurity stuff there. Um, and we were joined by fisheries officers and Department of Conservation who look at the hunting permits and that sort of thing. So a uh, really exciting key point to take away from this was that we found no marine pests this time around on any structures or vessels that we visited. We boarded 23 vessels. Um, compliance was really high with clean vessel passes for the commercial vessels and the fishing vessels, which is awesome. Um, a couple of issues with vessel passes. Um, so we had a few expired and a couple of vessels without clean vessel passes, um, but they were either syndicate vessels, so private vessels or recreational vessels. So there's a bit of follow-up to do there with education um, and some of the costs there we're able to recover as well if they don't have their passes with them. Um, when we came back through Deep Cove as well, we inspected all of the structures, mooring lines and vessels that were parked up there as well. So. Um, a few compliance issues with the clean vessel passes and again some follow-up there around uh, making sure everybody is aware of the rules and what they need to have um, to be in Deep Cove. Um, we also have one prosecution that is still ongoing under the Field and Pathways Plan. Uh, there's been delays in court due to COVID related issues there but it is now due to go before the court on the 20th of June so we look forward to seeing what will come out of that. Uh, next one, please, Ellie. <coughs> Clean vessel passes, as I'm sure most of you are aware, we, any vessel that enters the field and marine area requires a clean vessel pass. And that's essentially a declaration that when they enter, they've got a clean hull, clean ballast water and clean gear. Um, for this year, there's been an increase in clean vessel passes over the numbers reported for last year, which is really great to see, um, primarily, primarily a result of advocacy from all the agencies, so ourselves, DOC, the Marine Guardians, um, and a slight decrease in March, but um, very similar numbers. So, yeah, that's good to see that um, there was an increase. You know, most people that we came across in Fieldland knew all about the pathway plan rules and had their passes, which is awesome. Next, please. Uh, the Undaria Containment Trip. So these are a joint agency funded um, project, essentially. So between ourselves, the Department of Conservation and Biosecurity New Zealand. The purpose of these trips is to survey and contain the known extent of the Undaria incursions in Breaksea Sound and in Chalky Inlet. So we undertake these trips once per month over summer, and then they get pushed out to about five to six weeks over winter. Um, in terms of Chalky Inlet, we've had two and a half years without finding Andaria down there, so we are looking at reducing the frequency of these trips down to Chalky now, so we can uh, focus all the funding and efforts up and break sea sound. Um, we're also using some of the Jobs for Nature divers now on these trips, which is really exciting. Um, have using the local divers means less cost for the program, so we're not flying people around, and awesome that we can use some divers that we've trained up locally on this piece of work as well. Um, the image on the screen there is just an example from one of the recent trips. So we are still finding um, plants on the outskirts of the population. So really important that we keep up this, this work um, and try and contain Bundy area to the known area in Breaksea Sound. Another piece of work that's going alongside the containment project is um, Biosecurity New Zealand have secured and recently tendered um, a $250,000 worth of funding for um, tool development. So this is looking at different ways to either control or eradicate Undaria, um, and that will really help us in Breaksea Sound um, in terms of the containment efforts and the Jobs for Nature program that we've got going on at the moment. Next, please. Um, as Ali mentioned, we report in detail on the Jobs for Nation uh, jobs for Nature project up to OPEC, but I'll just provide you a quick overview of some of the milestones that we've achieved in year one so that you're all aware as well. So this is a two-year project and we reached the end of year one in March. So um, 
In terms of training, uh, the project trained 13 divers up to scientific COC standard. Um, that's a really intensive course and a lot of the divers had no previous experience. So really amazing from then that they've been able to complete all of the work safe and training requirements um, and get trained up to full level to be able to undertake scientific dive work for the program and also some of the wider programs I've mentioned before. Please. In terms of the amount of biomass they've removed, um, the total at the end of year one was approximately 30,000 30, kgs or 30 tonne, um, and that's across 25 kilometres of coastline in Breaksea Sound. Um, this is a massive achievement, and we didn't really have much of an idea of how they would go before the project started, but everyone is really impressed with the progress that these guys have made and how much they've actually been able to pull out, which is exciting. Um, next one. This map here just shows the length of coastline that they've covered during the Jobs of Nature project. So the dotted red line shows the 25 kilometres of coast that they've been covering. Um, you'll see around the Harbour Islands and the Big John Islands, these are areas that they've actually gone over multiple times because the Undaria was a lot denser in these areas. So the overall um, area that they've covered is probably closer to 30 to 35 kilometres if you count um, these areas that it made more sense to target our effort uh, where there was a lot of Undaria. So they essentially cleared this whole area of Undaria over once and then they went back over the areas where it was um, starting to regrow or more dense where they may have missed plants and that sort of thing. So um, the containment program, it off operates at the outer skirts of those um, dotted lines that you can see there and we're focusing our efforts um, in the high density areas in the middle there. Can I ask a stupid question? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Got a stupid, got a stupid question uh, coming. It's all the Bermuda Triangle. Yeah. <laughs> In my ignorance I asked this question, I presume looking at the map you're only picking up within a certain depth from the shore. So uh, are we confident that's where the dairy is, or is it throughout the whole sound and that's the only place we can physically get it? Yeah, so generally it just um, grows on the rock walls um, and only to a certain depth. So anywhere beyond about 12 metres, it's not really known to exist. The conditions aren't quite right with light and that sort of thing. So the guys are going along and they're having a look down further and we've got a few GPS points where that they may go back to if um, we need to go deeper but no it doesn't grow um, further out in a lot of these areas they drop away really quick to deep water so um, we're fairly confident that we're covering everything yeah okay it wasn't that stupid um, good question <laughs> I've got a question I'm going to ask yeah. this too. Um, just in regards to all the divers that are trained are they uh, are they local are they based in South and Otago and sticking around mm. future yes Yep, so that was the whole purpose of the project was to employ people from the local Tiano area that were affected by COVID, so potentially lost their jobs in the tourism sector and that sort of thing. So yes, the majority of our team are local Tiano residents um, and we have our dive supervisors, Andrea and Pauline, they worked in Tiano, but they're based in, um, so Andrea lives down in Invercargill, but she used to work for a company in Milford Sound, so Still affected by tourism, but yeah, not living in Tiano. So, just a follow up question. So, just in yep. regards, I feel like I'm talking to the um, Oh, I am. Um, so, so, like future proofing, would this, if there's any other outbreaks, things that you'd have a better team to get jump on these things quicker or get hit the martyr? Is that? Yes. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. So, a lot of the containment divers we use. Um, are from outside the region so this has been a really awesome project to get people that we know are going to stick around in Tiano because they're locals um, that'll be fully qualified and able to yeah, go into Fieldland um, at the drop of the hat if we need them to respond to future incursions or just support the ongoing work. Right, well good, oh, just another question. Yeah, just a question on the uh, clean vessel pa passes, that's actually good to see we've got prosecution going forward because that will certainly focus the minds of a few people but my question is to do with we get you have a lot of yachts moving around the countryside either from, from further afield New Zealand or even international ones are we managing to catch up on those and, and what's their knowledge like I know when we when we set up this we hoped that other regions would also um, go into the pathways sort of program which would actually help yeah 
Yeah, so we came across, I think it was three um, yachts that were from out of the region that had sailed down into Fjordland. Um, all of them knew about the clean vessel pass rules, the um, plan rules. So that was really good. Um, we work a lot with biosecurity in New Zealand. So our rules, um, a lot of people are aware. So say out of Wellington, some of these guys, they knew um, they'd been in touch with people at biosecurity in New Zealand. So they were aware of what they needed. Um, the Fjordland Pathways Plan is up for review this year. So we're looking at commencing that later in the year. Um, and part of that will be reviewing what is happening in the northern regions and how we can better link up with them as well. So, yeah, absolutely. It's something we need to do more of. So targeting some of those boat clubs in that further north so that they all know what they need. But, yeah, anecdotally this time around um, was really good to see um, that they all knew what they needed and, yeah, they'd been speaking to the right people. Uh, one more. Could, could, could I just ask uh, a related question? I'm just wondering about, um, say, with a with cruise ship with Zodiacs or Naiads on, <coughs> on board where um, they dropped into the fjord and waters without, and, and, and the hull isn't an issue, but the bilge water possibly is because they might have been they might have been in Dunedin or Bluff or, um, or Patterson in there the previous day whether there's a requirement to say slosh a um, half a cup full of janola or something like that in just to kill what might be in the bilge water or, or even on a, um, a small fishing boat that's got a dinghy, maybe the contamination can come in what's actually in the smaller boat that's going to be dropped into the field and waterways. Might be just something to add to the list. Yeah. Yes, that's yeah, exactly right. It's a good thing to consider. I mean, when they get their clean vessel passes, they essentially are just declaring that they're doing the right thing. Um, but it is hard to tell in reality um, what they're doing. But um, yeah, you're right. That's probably something we could work more on is working in with the cruise industry and just making sure that they're completely aware um, and doing the right thing before they're putting their vessels in the water and fueling. Okay, sorry. Uh, Peter, no, sorry, that's one more question, and then we'll get, keep moving on. Um, oh, Ellie, did you want to add something there? Yeah, I was just going to say um, the cruise ships um, are managed by the cruise ship, de cruise ship deed of agreement. Um, so they have to follow the biosecurity procedures in that. Um, but everything else, all kayaks, all tenders, everything on boats would still fall under the uh, pathways management plan. So if you've got a tender sitting on your boat, you need to make sure that that is as clean as the boat <coughs> itself when it goes into Fjordland. Right, Peter. Can you hear me, Kathy? Oh. Yes, yep, go I'm ahead. Because I'm not on the Zoom because I come in a wee bit late. But, um, look, you'll be working with a lot of dock staff through there, and I know the department is extremely focused on their aviation uh, footprint uh, through uh, climate change. They've had the hard word from government to, to really look at that, and I guess us being local government, we will be looking in that same direction. And of course, your work is around a lot of aviation to get to these places and far from places. So just wanting to say, keep it in the back of your mind about efficiencies that can be gained in the work that you do. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's been a few instances this year where we've um, tied in with DOT around um, but we assisted them in moving a kakapo because we had helicopters going in. Um, we worked with some of the other local operators such as Pure Salt um, to try and if we're having to fly things around, link up on logistics. So yeah, it's in the back of our mind that you're totally right. Um, getting people in and out of Braxy Sound does require helicopters generally. So yeah, a lot of um, helicopter movements involved. Thank you. All good. Well, you carry on, Catherine. Carry on. Cool. Um, so this milestone here just looks at the FTEs. So we had a target in our deed of funds of 10 FTEs in year one. Um, we smashed that target, which is awesome, and we employed 11.3 FTEs in year one. Um, we're able to use this figure as well, the leftovers, to carry over into year two, which will assist us. Um, we've got a slightly higher target for year two now that most of our people will be trained up and will hopefully uh, come back. So that's really awesome that the guys, they worked hard, they did overtime um, on some of the longer sunny days. We had a really good run of weather. So yeah, they did amazing to um, yeah, exceed that target in year one. Well, I don't want to, um, I wonder to Joe, just make one point. This, this project has been incredibly difficult to deliver. Um, 
not only on its complexity around getting divers trained and, and, and <coughs> that, that talent, COVID was massively impacted this problem and, and, and transit to and from the area was also um, significantly challenging through COVID. So I just wanted to just make this point, I'm not sure Ali would, would, have, would have done it, but I just want to recognise the team that managed to keep this program going for all those challenges and to be successful in the terms of the amount, the volume that they've taken and also a, a, you know, exceeding targets. It's actually phenomenal uh, achievement. I just thought I'd make that point, sure. Could it be, could it be said in, um, in, in public statements about the work, exactly what you just said, Paul, and even more, the work that we do in South and as Environment South and compared to our um, colleagues in Otago and Canterbury you know, we're really pushing through with this sort of work. Yes, agree. Yep, no, we'll, we'll agree with that. Um, yep, we'll carry on. Okay. Cool, uh, next slide, Ellie. Just one sort of final slide from me. This is a summary of the hours of work that we provided to local South and businesses. So that figure sat at around 3,650 for year one, and we provided an additional 1,650 hours of work to other COVID affected contractors from around the country. So uh, some examples we used scientific divers before Christmas from other regions to support our guys when they were still getting their scientific COC signed up. Um, Waiheke Dive, they essentially said to us that they would have had a terrible year without the support of ES. They came down and um, helped train our guys up to COC standard. Um, and some of the other businesses on the slide here are local businesses that have provided amazing support for us. And in turn, we've been able to give them really crucial work while they were struggling um, with the lack of visitors into Fjordland. So yeah, that's all from me. Happy to take any further questions or else I can um, pass over to Ali to wrap up. No, I think um, we've got one in the way. I just want to pick up on the, the comment that was made before. I, I think we should celebrate success. Mm. I, I just wonder whether it's from this committee or from the Greater Council, um, a letter of recognition to the group for the work they've done, the quantity extracted, and also the um, through from quite difficult situations, it looks like it's been a successful project. I, I think we, we need to do some more of that sort of stuff and, and acknowledge it. Yeah. And I think you need to remember yeah, the, 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 also yeah, the funding where it comes from and things. You know, yeah, I think we one don't necessarily agree all the time, get, but it's, yeah. it's got a, idea, when it works well and we can uh, see it together. This is the that everybody in South and then probably the Great New Zealand that you really appreciate. So, yeah, very uh, much so, uh, Peter. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Ellie, if you're still, you'll you'll be there. I just yeah. want to talk about predator free Rekiora and the linkages linkages we have um, with that, with our former chief executive now being sitting on that trust alongside some of our committee members like Stuart Ball sits on that trust too. Um, we've got a member of this group, the Stale Less, which is very heavily involved, especially in the in Bluff area around Predator Free, and Bluff's going to be extremely important as a quarantine area. Too. So I'm just, it's probably a, something to this committee is that uh, do we get in behind this project um, and really give the kick, it, kick along that it probably deserves. And I'm, I'm suggesting that at the new chief executive of that, of the Predator Free Group, we invite him along to, um, in another meeting that we might have in the near future here of this committee and talk to us about the project. And, and what support we could provide to give it that thrust. Sounds good. Yeah. All right. All taking notes. I think we, we can definitely do that. We've got good links in with them, so we can make sure um, Campbell comes to a meeting um, and talks about it. It's, um, it's really a community. So it's a community engagement that's going to be the hard bit on the community of Oban and Bluff is getting them all rowing in the same direction if they choose to. I, I think that's the challenge is going to be there more than getting rid of the piss. Absolutely. And um, I'll be sitting on the advisory and engagement group, at least for the short term. Um, it might pass over to a member of my team at some point, but we are going to keep committing to that and making sure that we're getting the best out of that group and making sure the community are being really heard. Um, by the trust as well, so yeah, fully behind that. 
Okay, well, thanks for that. Um, are we just going to morph into, or do we? Can we keep, I can keep, keep going? We, yep. 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 Cool. So um, I'm just going to quickly um, cover some biodiversity things. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on time, so I am going to go quite quickly, but if you need me to slow down, just to say so. So um, biodiversity um, projects within council, again, this is really interlinked with Jobs for Nature, um, but we just thought it'd be really good for regional services to hear um, about this because it used to be reported to you as part of the High Value Area Programme. Um, so we have started the new ecological survey work um, based on the Jobs for Nature funding. Um, we've got new contractors on the ground, um, but it has been a slower summer than we were hoping for. Um, and the contractors have been struggling to reach the targets that they need to, um, partly because of recruitment and partly because of difficulties contacting landowners. Um, but having said that, they have managed to um, complete 27 surveys, um, and I know they're busy working on an awful lot more over the autumn, so um, we have achieved something. And they've managed to survey over 6,200 hectares so far. And again, we're expecting those hectares to significantly increase over the next few weeks. Um, but it is something we're keeping an eye on, and we're um, looking at quite... Um, we're working with them on contract management to make sure they can actually fulfil their contract. Um, those 27 surveys and previous relationships and data that ES has held um, has resulted in 33 management plans completed. So that's with the biodiversity team going out, working with landowners and creating a really good management plan for them to help them with their long-term um, protection of their um, wetlands and things like that. And it links in really well with the Environmental Enhancement Fund. Um, so we've had a big funding increase again this year because of Jobs for Nature. Um, we have had 29 successful EEFs approved, of which 14 have gone to bush blocks, 14 have gone to different wetland types, um, including different heaps of different types of wetlands, but from estuary, um, estuarines, riparian, peat bogs, all sorts of different things, um, and then one scrub ecosystem. Um, put that into context, at least three of those sites have had threatened species on them, which is absolutely fantastic. And 14 of them cover really threatened ecosystems. So they're the ecosystems that Environment Southland has highlighted in the regional policy statement as important. And 12 of them cover the priority areas that we identified through a desktop exercise two years ago. So this money is now getting to target really important areas and have a really big impact on the biodiversity on the ground. Um, the funding is going to over 16,000 hectares. Um, it will deliver 29 kilometres of fencing, over 15,000 native plants, and over 15,000 hectares of pest control. So we're beginning to see some really good gains from that work. Um, the fund for next financial year has just opened, or just closed, sorry. We're trying to get ahead of the game and get applications in now. And we've had over 15 new applications. So it's looking like next year is gonna keep, continue to be successful. Um, we also do a reasonable amount of biodiversity monitoring. Um, we're still waiting for the national policy statement to come out that's gonna dictate what more monitoring we need to do over the, in, in the future. Um, so currently we're focusing on rodent monitoring for our community groups and bird monitoring for our community groups. Um, we're doing the rodent tracking at eight key sites. Um, and I'm not going to go over all of the results for you, um, but just wanted to show you how useful this information is for our community group. So the Amaui group, um, who do their pest control predominantly through trapping, have been able to see when the trapping regime is working. And the big drop that you'll see in 2021 is due to them realizing that the bait was moldy and changing to a different type of bait that doesn't go moldy. And it's having immediate results in terms of dropping rodent numbers. Um, the Bluff Hill Motopahui Environment Trust are also using the data effectively for their management and have been able to significantly reduce toxin use on the hill because they're able to see when rodent numbers are building, um, put toxin out just when they're needed and not have it out when it's not needed. We're also using it on our own land to find out what's going, what's going on in our own land. And we have seen a really good drop this year after a big winter of pest control down on the lower Matara. Um, you will notice a spike, a current spike with the um, lower Matara land. 
Um, and we think that is to do with a massive mast down there of fruiting species. Um, when they went into the tracking line, they said there was so much fruit in the bush that, and on the ground um, that they were just walking through it and it smelt of um, really fruity smell all through the bush, um, which is also a really good sign that the trees are quite healthy. Then on our five minute bird count data, um, we've been doing this since about 20, uh, 2004, I believe at these sites. Um, you'll see that it's pretty cons consistent and standard across the years. We're not seeing many changes, um, but we have started to see an increase in Tui and in Kakariki throughout the region or throughout the monitored site. Um, and we are beginning to see a difference between Tui and bellbirds. So as Tui numbers increase, bellbirds tend to decrease and vice versa. When the bellbirds go up, the Tui tend to go down, possibly because they're using the same habitat. This year, we've also tried to do some wetland call monitoring um, to try and find out what wetland species are in the ES land at the Lomatara. Um, we first did this in 2019, so this is the second repeat survey, um, and it's using um, call recorders. So we put them out for a certain length of time. We can then download the card and the computer is able to assess all of the different noises that that card has picked up. Unfortunately, we haven't managed to find any of the key species, threatened species we were looking for, which is bittern and crake. Um, but we have had bittern reported via um, citizen science and other people down there. So they, we do think they are around, but our um, monitoring unfortunately hasn't picked them up. That's quickly for me. I don't know if you've got any questions or if you want to pass over to yeah, Craig. One question, Lloyd. Yeah, Ali, could you just go back to that slide where you had the 15,000 hectares? Because something doesn't quite add up in my mind. You've got 16,400 hectares that you've got outputs on. It looks like there's one native plant per hectare. Is that correct? Not all of them, no, so not all of them are planting projects. So some of them will just be doing pest control and some of them will be doing planting. Okay. Um, so we tend to plant it a lot denser than that in uh, those areas. Right. My second, the, the real question I had was, I've planted a lot of natives in the last 18 months, but my survival rate's been hopeless. With the dry period or whatever, um, I'm looking there now, very few have actually, considering the density they were planted, very few have survived. I was wondering what your your um, record show is around planting trees and having active trees sitting there. What's your survival rate like? Um, the ones we've done on ES land is sitting at about 95%. Um, I don't know whether these ones are too new for the environmental enhancements to say. Um, I know on my own place I'm sitting at about 90% as well. So um, we could probably come out and have a look at your place if you wanted and provide you some advice on other things to try. Yeah, 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 we, we found two of the um, chart one room and microbiome plant projects around that 10% loss. Okay. Or what they are past the quality is going forward. But yes, the surrounds definitely maintaining the maintaining plants is where the key is going forward. Okay, any other questions? Thank you. I was just going to say, Ellie, I think they, when I've seen the, a few tuis flying around, I think uh, probably in the last five years has been the first time we've ever seen tuis on our farm in, in my life. Um, so there, there's a few more birds floating around, and I think it's got a lot to do with shoutabouts and things planted in the 90s, and more just just more more things there for them to it's connecting up all the all the uh, bushy areas and all that. So it's uh, quite good. I saw a beautiful white heron the other day too, which I've never seen too. But um, I think it was a white heron. I'm not a, <laughs> not a bird watcher, but um, um, any questions, Craig? You know, no more questions. So thanks, Ali. For that, okay. we'll move on to that. Craig? Actually, I'll, I'll just move, we'll, we'll do the item one anyway. Do, um, I'll move, I'll move, that move the, the result, note that for the report. Thank you very much. Seconder, Lloyd, uh, all in favour say aye. Aye. Against Gary, right, Craig, into it. Cool, cool, right, Craig. Um, I'm Craig, obviously, from Cashman Integration. Yeah, like the rest of us, it's pretty exciting to be here, and it's nice. Uh, thank you for letting us come and have a chat. Um, I'm just going to work through some of the some key work programs we've got coming up. Um, I'll get Ellie to click onto the next screen to see what 
Oh, yeah, New River Estuary. Perfect. Uh, yeah, so New River, River Estuary. Um, obviously, it was pretty nice to be here in, in, in the council chambers and not sort of like the ones stuck at home. So what, we, what we're doing a lot with the, the team members uh, is obviously because we've been working from home for the last three months is we're, we're making sure within cashman integration to be able to get them out and about in the field and uh, connect with the other team members and, and what, how we do that was uh, around uh, training, do a lot of training for, for the staff to ramp that up and part of that was, was popping down to the New River Estuary um, which is obviously a bit of a contentious area with obviously the way the estuary is and, and sort of the health, health of the estuary and possible ways to improve it is what we're looking at um, forward and um, great opportunity with uh, Leone, who's, who's head of the uh, contaminated land. So, with her, she obviously collaborates a lot with um, ICC, uh, other members of the council as well. But um, she she obviously jacked up ICC, ICC to come down. We had um, science, had new one from science here as well. Also, uh, Nick Perham popped in. So the right there, so science uh, was really talking about the, the health of the estuary and, and sort of what things we can do for it. Um, a lot of it, um, what we want to do is sort of engage with, um, look for opportunities as well, engage with other school groups, catchment groups. Um, we do have a planting site down at Stavey Craft there that um, we find it's really good for the local schools because they can come along and uh, do some plantings, get, get a feel for the estuary and what's sort of happening there. And um, so also what we're trying to do is start start a lot, a lot of talking down there and that's with uh, what I do the catch the new river estuary catch uh, forum yeah. new forum group so they're, they're talking with EWE, ICC um, just to look at uh, better ways to understand the, the history and the health that's what we're going forward Any questions on Lloyd? Sure. Don't take this the wrong way, but we can plant what we like around the outside. But there's some fundamental issues with that estuary, and I think Iwi's on to it. I think uh, we've got a person on the ICC Council now as a member. I, I think there's some real big conversations that need to be had, and this other stuff will, will mm. follow on. Um, mm. I don't see us getting much momentum until we deal with some of those big issues that are sitting there. I'm specifically talking about the, the discharge from the city. I think we need to think about that. Storm water and then the somehow containing and managing the, the dump site that's, that might be closed, but the effect of that area is actually quite big. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's quite a high uh, sediment retained in that history as well. Yeah, well, the, there's, there's been some alignment in the rivers that you would say was a great idea when they did them, but we might have a personal view now, we never finished it off completely. But we need to relook at our management style there and look at it differently. So I think there's some major work that we need to do. And I'd like to do that with all parties, ICC, SDC, because we're all part of that together. Um, and that can be then multiplied out through the other estuaries. I think it's important that we look after what's good and we attack right. what is deteriorated. Right, you know, down there was it's a beautiful day and it, was, it looked a nice vista with the, with the waterways. However, you don't really know the underlining effects of the contaminants sort of going into the estuary, then you, you don't really realise you can't do anything about it, eh? And help. So, I think um, there is, yeah, that's with that New River Forum group that's been formed, is, is looking at, at that sort of those sort of problems and issues. Um, I think they need help because I was on the original group, I've been in any meetings lately, but. It was about how do we move, that's where this, this Craig was trying to put the effort on, how do we do this mm. stuff, how do we move it forward, mm. I think they need some help, mm. and we're the obvious partner to help some of that discussion, support, guidance. Sounds good. Um, Peter, and then Michael. Thanks Mr Chairman, totally agree with that, the big issues in the New River Forum building, helping them, you know, their main, their main challenge is how do you get a city of 50,000 people to turn around and face that estuary and care about it. That's the number one thing, so engagement. Mm. And keep on the work you're doing, great building those relationships, yeah. because once you get that, if we continue on with that, when the big work comes, like when Lloyd's suggesting, we'll have all those relationships in place and that trust in place, 
So I think you're yeah, totally on the right track. Oh, I like it. And, and one of the good things too down there, just on the sideline, was having um, Adrian from ITC really showcase the history of how things come about, which was, which was really interesting. And nowadays we sort of lose what, where it sort of come from and how and why. And the estuary could be a, a place that you we can stride in there in a clumsy sort of fashion and get offside with a lot of people really quickly. Mm. But that behind the scenes building the trust is the right approach, I think. So you, you continue on. Mm. Yeah. Good points. Black one. Yeah, th thanks for the report. It's good to see that our staff are working with ICC and EWI. Uh, we had a meeting recently, and I, I believe we probably should have a couple of our government's team perhaps on that um, that estuary thing because you want the, the, the planting is not behind the first thing, but it's actually giving it's giving the whole community its interest in the hill. And because without a bit of robustness in there, and people go and think this problem's too big, we can't do anything. And it's actually starting to get some of that stuff going. And I've said in the past it'd be great to get a group going and, and possibly. Doing something like that all day, and you might make a mess for a start. But if, if, we, if we could go in there with a whole lot of groups, and I think you know, you know, some of the commercial people would probably help with, with, with diggers, and I've had to bring in sand, etc., plantings. Yeah, well, it won't fix the estuary, it would be one little step. And um, mm -hmm. I think there's an ability to join up um, urban, and, urban and rural. And, 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 and while it's a long term project, it, it's a good place to start. No further questions. You're all yeah, good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's probably good. Uh, when you know, we talk about sort of restoration. So down at the Waipai River, there by the Waipai Dam, this is another, another area that's of um, a couple of key staff there have actually got quite passionate about this area and then taken on board and ready. Taking charge in, in, in this area, which is fantastic, because we've got 550 plants, native plants planted down down there, and really we've got a, a huge increase or significant increase of schools wanting to come down and use the site for education to do planting. Um, also, you know, it's a good way to educate them around climate change, carbon sequestration, that sort of thing. How are the, the really neat thing too also with the schools coming down, they're not just wanting planting, they're actually helping to, to do other, other um, do more, more than just planting I should say really. So a good example of that, it's like James Targus students designing an information panel, so you know, the public come down, we can uh, have a look at what sort of plants are there, what's been happening. Uh, and we've got the SIT students working uh, with the local Wahopai Renanga to create resources also for cultural awareness down there, so I could find nice with the information panel. Uh, also, the Southland Fields Leo Club uh, want to install a bench or seat, so obviously, you can get down there, you can admire the, the, the plantings because uh, the plantings are uh, sort of key to through that area in a sense, making a nice, so you get a nice. It's not just sort of planting in one area, we've got like a wee path in, in the middle, so you can render through, and we're looking at uh, obviously planting uh, the, the, the whole area out for that moment, so the small, small area, so just to beautify that area. Uh, but it's also, we're, the great thing is we're sourcing the plants locally from um, the eco sourced, so keeping that in check. And also, um, yeah, just, just got to keep, keep in mind too, like, um, you know, obviously, we get quite a few planting sites that we've just got to. Make sure we can sort of manage those and keep keep them right as, as um, what we were saying around getting plants survived and maintained. But that's that's what we sort of found with, with this area. Because obviously um, it's been there for a while, had a few staff changes and whatnot, um, the plants have wanted to get a wet sort of not weren't doing the best. Uh, so we've been tipping the gear, got some more guards on them, got got a um, get the contractor down to at least play the to maintain the plants by weed eating that sort of thing. So yeah, it's gonna come a nice, nice sort of beautiful area. Good. We'll keep moving on. Oh Peter. Yes, yeah, um you talked about that. I was and I've, I've mentioned this before in this committee a year ago and sort of got a bit of a humorous uh, 
uh, uh, people laughed, but they thought it was. Oh, but I'm going to. I'm going to back yeah. yeah, I was going to. I was going to talk about Ada Puni. I had to go into Kmart the other day again. And you oh, go. Yes. There's a big long yes. escalator. You go up and you go down. You can't help but just look out the window, and it's just a bit yuck. Mm. And I, th I really go in there, but twice that I've gone on there. What can be done? It's such a public facing area, isn't it? And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're going up and down there and have a wee mm -hmm. look. Put the thinking cap on. If it's, it's very difficult with the concrete and stuff there and the water yeah. flow and yeah. Well, um, I suppose I didn't realise, but um, one of our previous team leaders did a when we did the target catchments project today. He did on Ota Puni, and uh, he sort of mimicked or copied like sort of over in England what they sort of do with the structure. So, so I think there is some engagement. I think Fiona was saying some engagement with uh, East SDC and the ICC around around that because you can actually. Create a nice wee habitat in, in that structure. Waterways, yeah. yeah, waterways. So, so you use two things. So you're actually filtering the filtering the sort of contaminants and coming in, flow. but also enough flow and also a bit more picturesque as well, which should be yeah, quite, that, that quite nice because it is a, wee, a very small but very mm. high profile patch of water mm. that everyone. Mm. It's just it's just sort of working collaboratively and, and then get lots of strength from lots of yeah. yourselves to. Good, we'll keep moving on. Cool, and um, on to the next one of the chart. It's a good sort of one. Right. Yeah, chart and Waipiru, Waipiru project. Yeah, so that's in its third and final year. So we've got 20,000 plants already um, planted to date, with another 10,000 uh, on track to plant this year. Um, so we've, we've, it's been going, it's really good. It's this year in the sense that we've um, really on track. We've got 7,000 plants already stored at a, a location to get looked after. So we've got them from uh, Milton and, and Pago prisons. And we're still waiting on another 3,000 coming in for spring for planting. So it's, so it's really nice to have those plants here on board so we don't have any hold ups waiting for the plants coming in the prisons. And sort of thing. So it's a nice collaboration, obviously, between. Rinanga, who then work with the prisons to, to, to grow the plants and also the contractors here in Byron South. Um, you can have a look, uh, it's probably a bit hard to see, but the top photo here is where the contracts were planting. That's really crucial to the to the planting program in the sense that uh, they're really passionate about uh, the planting of the plants and looking after them. So even, even putting in the guards, uh, you've got four stakes. What, how they plant it's sort of perfect, and then um, on the, the slide below, that's uh, a landowner's property as well. That's that's feeding into the Charden stream, Charden Wamumu stream, and uh, there's sort of three tributaries going in there. So it's nice to see that how we sort of get the right green plant in to, to, to mitigate any and then flow the nutrients going into the, into the stream and also beautifying it. Any, any questions on? It's a great project. Yeah, and I have a quick look yeah. at my tuna yeah. and some of the things that are going on. I'm going to be up into this area. Yes. Have a look at and, and front up to this investment. That'd be great, and, and I'm sure the landowners would, would love that because they're quite uh, proud of the, the plants that they've got. And, and be amazed. I think we had a quick look last year with, you know, with some other. So key members and and yeah, the co-fi would be very high, and we only planted like the year before. So it's actually, so it's amazing. Yeah. It's good. Yep. Yep. Next slide, Ellie. Yep. Yeah. Intensive winter grazing. It's quite hot topic. Co. Um, let's see. The, the the picture on the right is is really just to show the operational plan that's in place around winter grazing. So it shows we're working internally. Yeah. With likes of compliance, consents, planning, uh, catchment integration, um, so sort of the part, sort of three main headings here is around regulation, education, and extension, partnership, and relationships. So it just shows us on the right there the depth of detail going into it, which is really nice to see. And we'll just go on to the next slide, Ali. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so out of that, as part of it, is um, this intensive winter grazing proactive engagement. 
included with um, the aerial and uh, we just sort of completed the roadside visual assessment um, up, on, up on the sort of uh, see on the top and right hand side, it's just an aerial photograph of just want to showcase really the, 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 the fantastic great changes that are happening out there. We're noticing that it's it's not all sort of doom and gloom, that there's actually really good good work going on around um, like the bottom one with critical source areas. So there's not just uh, a, a, a small five metre buffer, no, you get so like a, up to sort of 80 metres sort of buffers. Same with the wetland ones sort of above, they're not actually going and, and trying to crop those. So um, yeah, so it's not nice. So I was also sort of involved with getting out with the roadside assessments with, with the team. So it's eleven us getting out, out and about, checking on the roadside assessment. And um, out of that, oh, I'll probably push the next slide is um, yeah, we're going to the next one. But just previously before that. We're doing a lot of comms with the communications, comms advertising. So you might have seen, seen like Fiona on TV, TV One News. I'll look at Google that. So that's a really good reputation of um, getting the story out of how how we're actually doing the proactive and trying to help farmers educate and um, get some advice to them going forward. Uh, so it's around the comms. It's on Hot New Radio. Printed media. But what was what, what we're sort of heading out about to just to talk about the collaboration side, uh, which uh, Ed Federated Farmers come along and then they were feeding back to Dairy and Zed and um, Beef and Land. And, and just because we're in COVID times, we, we can only bring lots of um, Federated Farmers. So it's, it's really good to get them to come along and build that relationship and, and get to see their side too. Of, with the grazing and their advice, and they're, they're right behind us, saying, which is really nice to see. Uh, if just go to the next slide, so it carries on. Yeah, so just talking about it. with us driving around on the roadside, you can see the map there on the right. It's got all the all those dots, is all the locations of, of where we're looking at these uh, sites. So you can see we even went up to uh, Nokomai and, and way down to. Um, Eastern side, eastern side. So, so don't don't be too scared because there's a lot of those dots. Also, when we're recording, we've got good practice. So we've got good, good practice right through to the risky practice that we're looking for around crop selection, um, that sort of stuff before you before you get to the to the winter grazing period. Um, so out of that, all those sites there, we've got eleven high risk sites that we're going to follow up for. Mate. It's pretty good. Mm. It's pretty good. Let's mm. so, yep. um, it's such a widespread practice in South, and every corner you turn, mm. on any road mm. out in the rural areas, there's a crop pad, mm. and that's why I think the task has been so enormous. It has You're still going to yep. travel very far to find the worst of examples, and it's hard to explain that to people when it's such a widespread practice for so long. Yep. And, and I describe it as then the middle has certainly shifted. So in all of these, you start off with education as the biggest chunk and enforcement is the smallest, but it gets to a point that that education has to tighten up and the enforcement has to take over. So on the feedback I get from intensive winter grazing during those real crunch times, um, and we know what it is, don't we guys, and those, mm. you get, we get the phone calls, is that there's a large and growing larger group of farmers that are sick of the poor, the poor operators. They feel as though they're putting their practice at risk. Definitely. And that's the phone calls I'm getting now is do something. Do something uh, about these people. So that's changed quite a lot over, just over the last couple of years uh, to points where catchment groups are bringing people together for meetings, trying to yeah. trying to sort of highlight the bad practice. They're actually doing the policing, which I'm not really comfortable with farmers policing other farmers, but that seems to be what's going on at the moment. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a biggie, isn't it? It is a biggie, yeah. It's, it's nice, nice to have a, a 
got, got one question from Lloyd, but I've got a question after just making sure I haven't got a dot beside my farm. So. <laughs> <laughs> Might be a good one. Well, that's the thing that you've said they're good and bad. That confuses me now. I want one or not. So. But anyway. I have a good dot. So um, no. Yeah, just checking. I won't tell you where I am, but I'm, I'm just yeah, checking. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty close to the border. Um, uh, just like I know, we personally know that there is a lot of a lot of stuff going on. You can see how people do it. They yeah. may not necessarily, you wonder why they winter in their paddock, but then they, how they winter their paddock right. is changing. But it would, just, it would just, like looking at what you're seeing, is that there, I would have said more, more often than not, that people are changing, are thinking about what they're doing. Yeah. And that's a pretty common thing. Like I know I can see it on the road, so I know what I'm looking for. Yeah. Is that what your team would be saying to Yes, it's, it's bang on what we've, we've noticed. That's why I sort of try to highlight with the other photos that yeah. are sort of banged up, is we're noticing the change from you know, even sort of a couple of years ago. It's, it's a huge change to some, like we're, we're going out and seeing, seeing these really good buffer zones. We're like, wow, we never would have seen that a couple of years ago. And, uh, and just the way, even just the bell placement, um, even the paddock selection is, is really improving as well. And that's sort of that's sort of a lot of things we'll, we talk to, the ones of the, you know, the lever that we go through mm. uh, forward, which is not too bad because when we break it down to the, you know, obviously the three catchments, there's only like three three to five in each catchment, which is which is really, it's quite a manageable thing for us as well. And as I like to, because we've got to spend a bit of time with them. And, yeah. and we're finding, what the team's finding is that the, you know, you're ringing up a landowner, you sort of expect to be used or, or nah, but they actually be really quite receptive of, of of us coming to go and see them and, and appreciate the, the the help that we're sort of offering. So it's, it's really so it's quite nice for the team rather than um, you know getting knocked back all the time. Well, that's it's good to see getting from someone else's view. You might think you're doing it right. Oh, yeah, I've done everything right. But I think it's always the perception of someone else is what does that look like? So I know that's what it was. You've answered my question. I was going to say how receptive are those leaving, but they're reasonably constructive, like receptive. Well, really, uh, yeah. Of course, you do get the odd one. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's yeah. life and society. And it's, yeah. Um, yeah. Lloyd, then, Nicole, sorry. Yeah, you, you partly answered my question, but it was, um, uh, I think you mentioned it, but I don't think we, we emphasise importance enough. The 11 follow-ups before the end of May is actually quite crucial. Um, farmers talk, as you know, so you know the follow-ups, you, you might have 11, but you've actually had 33 effects if it were you know, multiple. Yeah. But I'm, I've spoken about this before, but sometimes those situations aren't that good. And sometimes you might be talking to the farmer and getting a good response, but if you look at the wife, she's just about fuming. Been in one place where the, the jug board and I haven't seen a cup of tea yet. You know, mm -hmm. things can turn pretty mm. quick. So I'm, I'm just making sure that the staff are aware whether or not I'm talking about these difficult situations more so after the first of June than before. That we are aware of the bigger pressures. Um, sometimes this is a result of other things in their personal mm -hmm. life, this mm -hmm. is things that. Um, we see, but the, the emotional state is not in a good place, mm. and we need to be very aware of that. Mm. And use the other institutions that we have around us for our support or whatever, because mm. those things are quite important. Mm. So, yeah, thank you. It's one of those things we just need to be aware of as we go in. But I think your pre bay visits are actually more important than what you realise. As you say, I'm here to help. This is an area we see it's at risk. Mm. We don't want to come back and have another conversation, and you don't want us back either. You know, mm -hmm. you, you can cheer it up, but I think it's just important. That's right, and that can help to relieve that stress to another. Yeah. 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 yeah, thanks, Mr. Stephen. Um, I can see from the dots there are probably one or two places you're visiting that have had issues in the past, which is actually good to um, make sure that this year's um, crop, crop is good. The other thing is, you mentioned communication. I was sort of hearing a while ago that perhaps the industry good groups and ourselves aren't as linked up as we've been in the past. Mm. Really, we want yeah. one pager, clear communication going out there that's consistent. Mm. We're, in the, we're still in the education phase, but we know once we move into June, if people haven't heeded it, um, we're going to be in the regulatory space. So, so uh, yeah, I don't think we can emphasize enough of actually getting that clear, consistent messaging going out from everybody. It's been powerful in the past, but we know um, 
the, you know, the silly areas that we're, we're in, we totally picked up. Well done. Yeah, it's all good. No, oh, uh, can I have someone to make the new note? Please just have the customer to make. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, there is. Yep, if, if that's all right with you, Mr. Chair, oh, yes. I've got a few more things to go through. Just trying to keep up the play, sorry. Sorry, cool. Um, so oh. this is um, just a quick report on um, the both the biosecurity biodiversity, oh, so biosecurity and the um, catchment integration customer survey. Um, it was done before laws became catchment integration, hence you'll see land and water and laws through it. Um, this is a biannual survey that we do, um, and Fiona and I normally present back on. Um, it's been going since 2004, but um, we changed it up a little bit in 2019, so the results are directly um, relatable to 2019. Um, we do this predominantly to find out how well our comms is going and how well our messaging and education programs are going. Um, for biosecurity, that relates directly to the biosecurity strategy and objective two, where we've got some quite clear things in there that we said we're going to do and just checking in in terms of how we're actually doing. Um, and the land and water one relates directly to the LTP and what that division is supposed to be achieving in terms of education. So how do we do it? Um, we actually recruit or um, employ a expert company to do this for us. So it's done independently. Um, they reach out to 380 of our ratepayers, or residents, sorry, um, by phone. And they have a set of 12 biosecurity questions and a set of 12 land sustainability questions. And they do them alternatively. So not everybody gets them in the same order um, each time so that there's no bias in terms of which question you answer first. Um, they try and get a reasonable spread across the whole region. So we have, they reach out to people in Southland District, Invercargill and Gore District. Um, we find that most of the people that they manage to get hold of on the phone are in the age 30 to 64 age group. So it is only a subsection of the community that we're managing to get through to this way. Um, but we do manage to get a pretty even gender split. Um, and we do tend to find that the um, urban and rural urban uh, sorry the urban fringe is slightly different to the truly rural community in terms of the results in addition to the phone surveys um, we also try and get it out on facebook and we send it directly out to our stakeholders um, so we are doing some targeted research as well um, but this year we did find it quite hard to get the online and stakeholder results back um, I think that may be over consultation fatigue or just everyone's busy with things. So we didn't get as many results this year. So the results presented are literally just for the phone surveys. Um, so what is our community telling us about our comms? Um, there is still a bit of confusion out there around environment Southland's role in biosecurity. Um, less than half of the region realized that we have that lead in that biosecurity space. Um, and it has dropped since 2019. Um, uh, but we're sitting about around about the same in terms of people's understanding of what a harmful species is. So around 60% of the region are confident they know what a harmful species is, which is a pretty reasonable result. Um, when we asked if they'd actually seen communications from us over the last six months in terms of harmful species and pest management, um, it's pretty low and we've had a big drop since 2019. Um, so only 28% of people had seen anything from us. There may be that over 2021, everyone just had COVID fatigue and was um, busy looking at other different types of news and our messaging just wasn't getting through. Um, it could be that we weren't putting um, enough out there or our messages weren't clear enough. Um, we do now have a person working in comms supporting biosecurity four days a week, which I think will make a massive difference to this and we can make sure that our messaging is getting out or being much clearer. When we've asked people what sort of communications they want, um, we're sort of expecting that people would come back saying they want social media, but actually there is still a preference for hard leaflet drops with direct information on them. And there's still a lot of people using newspapers. So Facebook only comes in around the 20% mark. Um, and the radio, which is one of the things we use for most of our pest stuff year in, year out, is way down at 6%. So 
So we're going to be working with the comms team in terms of how do we make sure that we're using the right channels to target the right people for our messaging, because we might not be getting it quite right at the moment. Um, when we started asking around how important do you think biosecurity and um, the management of harmful species is to yourself and your community? Um, yep, people think it's important, but it has dropped massively since 2019 as well. So we've lost 10% down to 79% that think it's important. Um, but when we asked around doing active pest control yourselves, we've got 78, 79% of the community that are involved in some form of pest control. That might be just doing their mice in the roof or um, dandelions from the lawn, but people are doing something on their property um, with pest control. And we haven't had much change since 2019. And again, the engagement in the community group that may do um, weed or pest, plant, pest animal control is roughly about the same with a possible slight increase. So about 10% of our community are getting out there involved with a community group to do something in the pest space. Looking from the land sustainability um, side, um, they asked questions around um, environmental issues and people's knowledge of what the things that ES does and the things that we're promoting. Um, again, we've had quite a big drop between what people are seeing between 2019 and 2021. So only 40% of people saw messaging around environmental issues from Environment Southland, um, the land sustainability environment Southland last year. What they did see was generally around planting and fencing of streams um, or lake monitoring, but then they're also seeing things around weed control, biodiversity, pollution prevention and general pest control. Um, I think there's a feeling out there from the survey that we're asking around the different divisions, but for the general public, they don't understand the difference between biosecurity and law. So they're answering as environment path under the whole, which is probably the way it should be anyway. Um, Looking at the level of engagement environmental activities, um, quite a surprising result in that only 26 and 30% of people are interested or, or doing, sorry, doing environmental involvement and slightly worrying the people that are not interested in doing environmental management is up at 37%. Um, some of the commentary that comes with that is around that people are just busy um, there's a lot of other things going on. They don't think um, issues affect them. So if they don't have a stream on their property, they don't think they need to worry about water quality. Um, it's just another thing to do on top of everything else. Um, and then quite a bit of feedback around just not knowing what to do or what, what they could be doing. Um, and so needing more information about how to be involved or more events so that they can get involved and increase that level of interest and keep going. Um, so overall, the um, survey says that there, there's a reasonable awareness that action is really low and that's probably something that we need to be thinking about over the next 12 months in terms of how we can improve that. Um, the types of things people are doing, um, planting trees is um, the, the number one, everyone loves planting trees, lots of people involved in that, pest control really important and rubbish cleanups. Um, Weeds, nowhere near as popular as doing animal pest control. Um, and then only a few people getting really involved in discussion groups or debates and things that are going on in the community. And um, the types of groups that people are involved in, um, predominantly community groups. There's also um, government groups, catchment groups, and quite a lot of school work happening. And that is everything we have. So happy to answer any questions on that. Yeah, I've got a quick question. Obviously, is it going from 2019 to 2021, you're pre-COVID in the middle of two years after it, it looks like it's a bit, bit like society of, you, we're, we're a bit tired. We don't, you know, we're a bit switched off from what's going on, looking, looking to themselves. You know, it's, we've lost that community involvement with it. I mean, this, you know, looking at some of these numbers, that would be a bit of an indication like that, wouldn't it? That would be my guess of what's going on, but I can't be sure. Yeah. That's the way a lot of the community feels at the moment. Um, Louis, did you have a quick mention yeah, there, Peter? Points. Um, first of all, I didn't know whether you use landline or cell phone, so I wasn't too sure how you contact people. We buy a phone list from um, 
or the, sorry, the company that do it by phone lists. So if you've signed up to something where you've put on your cookies that you're happy for that information to be shared with other parties, that's the sort of phone list that we buy. So it's a combination of landlines and cell phones. So, so um, one of the comments I thought my way through was um, in a commuter, in a media interaction that I get quite a few text messages and I don't know whether we do text messaging from a four digit number comes through and it'll be during dead meetings or, or other things as they want to get um, to me as an individual. I'm not, I'm not surprised at those numbers. I look at them as pretty disengaged, Ellie, really. Like those numbers are 20% and below. I see that as a challenge ahead of us because we're in this game all the time and we see what's going on and we hear the conversations, but the general public doesn't. So we think we're in a different starting position than what we actually are. And maybe we need to think about that. This is 101 stuff in some respects because we're not, we're not connected as well. And the other thing I thought was if you ask the consent holders that we interact with, would you get the same results? So I'm just wondering what the profile looks like to the people that we do business with. Because if you have a lot of um, a lot of businesses out there that don't have an, a reason to interact, then the approach is quite different to those that have interaction because of consent processes or compliance activities. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm disappointed in the numbers. I'm not surprised at the numbers, but I think we've really got to understand if we're going to go forward with communication, we've got to start knowing that the base level of, of understanding is low. Thanks. Uh, Peter and then Lloyd, sorry. Yeah, um, that's really good information, and I hope we can use it in other areas. Um, I know from my constituents in my area, which is reasonably a traditional rural area, the kitchen table, mm. all information still goes. You can talk all you want about media, social media platforms and the way to do that, but the reality is the vast percentage go over the kitchen table. Um, I'd also say that when you talk to people about biodiversity, they don't know what it means. We just assume that people do mean... I'll give you a good example. So about four years ago down at the Bluff um, Land Care Group, well, it was there, they put a survey out to the... The, the, the townspeople, and the number one thing that come back is they wanted to see the bird song back in Bluff like it used to be. The next thing they said is they don't believe that killing predators is a good thing. So it showed that group down there that there's linkages between killing predators and, and enhancing and creating that habitat. They didn't link that to the bird. So, so there's well, we assume there's linkages there, everyone must know. We've got to take it right back uh, and make those connections. Lloyd? Yeah, I was, going to, um, I was going to make the comment about communication as well, but it's a big issue. It's, it's harder now to communicate than it was 20 or 30 years ago because you're not in the phone book because you've got a cell phone and I don't know your number. I don't know your email. If you're not engaged with um, social media, you're missing out. Um, because you don't get the newspaper, you're, not, you're, you're missing out on that, um, on that information. And the, and the mail system is barely functioning. So it's harder to communicate now than it was 30 years ago. That's quite right. Item three. Um, yeah, on, 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 can someone move uh, to recommend that item three? We're basically, I'm thanks, thanks for all that. Ellie, in your comments, but we're basically saying the challenge is big. We're not as touching base as, what, as much as we thought we were. And I'm just wondering have you got enough to actually take it forward to think about how we can address this? Because um, Quite frankly, if you're ringing me up for a survey, I'm busy. I'm just fed up with survey to death. Um, so, so is there, have, you, have you got something out of what our conversation is? Because we're all saying the same thing. We'd like to connect better. Not too sure how to do it. And, and somehow we need to get the messages out. Yeah. Or it's going to be hard for us to go forward with the community. 
Yeah, and I think another important bit of the probably the context is that um, the strategy team, Rachel Miller's team, is working on a really comprehensive engagement um, information for the whole council. So this has been sort of a bit of a historic thing where we just do it division by division um, and bio and laws have tried to join up, whereas actually we're going to start doing it for the whole council because we need to be effective across the whole council, not just a couple of us. Um, so there is a lot happening and we are learning as we go, well, I guess. And while, while Jan's sorting that out, might, might, might pay to say, hey, part of, part of this is a, um, you know, my time at Environment Canterbury um, suffered the same problems, but there's only a certain percentage of people that are, let's say, interested to respond and, and the work that the regional council does. So there's, you know, there's lots of work that can be done to improve that sort of um, uh, understanding and interest, but, but the, to some degree, there's, there'll always be a certain percentage of the population that's interested or not. I think it's a, a wider conversation that we might want to have come back at some point. Yeah, I'm just waiting on that we come back, but I'm mm. assuming they, if those numbers are bigger, I wouldn't be as worried, but I am quite worried because they're quite low. Yeah. If it was 70, 80 percent, that would be okay, but 20 percent or lower, I'm just not there. I, I'm just wondering, Ali, picking up on your point, are we doing too much individual stuff and should we be doing more an ES response and not just a divisional response to a survey? Like, are we learning what we want to or is it comparable to the other survey? Um, I think we definitely need to be starting to join things up a lot more and I know that's what Paul's really keen to do with integrated catchment management and all just getting it and having one quick set of messages. If I was a landowner that was being bombarded from a server from biosecurity and then another one from catch and you know I would be totally over it as well so I think the work that Rachel's doing and really supporting that and what her team are doing using this as background information but then just doing one good and sorry I can't remember the project off the top of my head but it's in the long-term plan and it's part of next year's plan so I think that's where our focus should be but we can learn from this as well for that short term and going forward. But you and Nella, we've got Eckleby, yeah, we can be to move. Move. <laughs> that be good. Yeah, got a second there for this. Sorry, just quickly to clarify, yes. that, cust Ellie. that customer survey bit was half item one and half item two. It's not item three. It was Fiona and I were going to separate them, but we've linked okay. them. So sorry for the confusion on that. Yeah, we're we're moving item three to item two, so we'll, we'll, I think we're all good as gold. I've uh, got two movers, the two lords. Uh, all in favour, say aye. Aye. Against carried. Right, we'll move into item four, catchment operations update. And we got Randall. There's Randall. You yes, thank you. This Randall, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I take the report as read, but I do have a couple of staff updates to provide and share with the councillors. Uh, on page 21, uh, we have an update to the Street Pump Station uh, project. That, um, advising that the tender has been extended to the 31st of May. That was a request that came from uh, potential suppliers. They felt that they needed more time due to COVID uh, to prepare their high quality response. Uh, the pumps have been prepared for shipping and are scheduled for shipping from Holland on the 6th of June. And in regards to the second paragraph on the ready catchment, uh, the consent, consent application has been prepared and uh, I'm going to see that progress shortly. Page 22. In regards to the wire catchment and the mediation uh, that's referred to there, the 10 year erosion plan has been completed and is ready for stakeholders' comment. Uh, we want to reconvene uh, with Meridian and the the group there as soon as possible uh, and definitely before the wire catchment liaison meeting uh, on the 14th of June. Uh, the staff have been working on some management plans for the Whitestone River and we've had positive discussions with Dock and Fishing Game to progress some trial works. Uh, it's our intention uh, to get those contract works to be completed or started and completed by early August. Uh, for the Aparima, we've had discussions with landowners and Southern District Council in regards to removing some mature trees from the stock banks, and that is ongoing work that needs to be done as part of this year's uh, maintenance program. 
Uh, also note that the catchment liaison meetings have been scheduled from the 18th of May to the 14th of June, uh, and I welcome any questions. Right. Thanks, Randall. Uh, Lloyd, and Peter, thanks for chairing. Uh, Randall, top of page 12, you, you talk about gravel management. What's come up in other meetings I've been at is um, gravel board up under bridges, and we've talked about I mean, the bridge was designed and built, there was a certain size of um, basically volume, capacity underneath. And I'd be interested when this gravel survey work is done, whether those bridges still have that capacity sitting underneath them. Yes, through the chair, it's in discussions with staff and particularly around the IRG project uh, for Gore. It is a current issue as I understand it, so we'll be looking very closely at that. The gravel management paragraph there is, is we've got staff that are digitizing historic cross-section survey data, and that's principally so that we can utilize that with the, um, the LIDAR work that's been completed. So the data that we're getting shortly is specifically for the Matara catchment, but it will be uh, valuable for us for gravel uh, management in other areas as well. And just to follow on to that, because we've got the Ripley Liaison meetings, the, the pool's been different now, I think. Um, the one in Tiania, the NZTA bridge up there, will be one that we will need to have an answer for, because the, the expectation, the community thinks that that um, capacity under the bridge has deteriorated significantly uh, to the point that that bridge may be removed by a major flood. We need to have an answer for that question up there. Uh, so through, through the chair, we'll, we'll be working on that and having that answer for that meeting. Thanks, Peter. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, just want to talk on that about the gravel management too and the LIDAR work being undertaken by Land Pro. Um, will that information that you collect on the Patara catchment, for example, will that Will we be able to use that in other areas of our business or will it be specific to this work? So what I'm saying is, so I have seen a presentation last year from Linz on the LIDAR work and it's amazing to know that they told us quite clearly that where they think there's a historical floodplain, sometimes there isn't, but the LIDAR doesn't lie. And it's a great piece of technology. Um, so we're going to use it quite widely. We're going to make sure we don't duplicate the cost and duplicate the work from one division to another. So that's the basis of my question. Yeah, so through the chair, part of the, the work that we have to do is digitise the historic data so that the, the other divisions have got that comparison to what was from 2012 and earlier uh, to what we've got now as a result of that 20, uh, you know, that flood through this. Well, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I've noticed the interest the, uh, the, we're talking to the Department of Conservation over the Cludow River. I can remember when I first was on council, there was a just suggestion that we contract. We were contracted to do the work. The council at the time said it was outside our area and we didn't do it, but uh, we have got the expertise and I actually argued for it at the time. So it'd be interesting to see that, how that goes because it's, you know, obviously a dynamic climate in there and there's the first job has probably not been as successful as it could have been. Uh, so through the chair, I haven't had an update uh, in regards to that um, agenda item. It was a discussion that was being managed by my predecessor, but I believe that it's around the funding of those works is where it's got to. Yeah. Can I just bring up what Lloyd said early on about those bridges and the heights and the increased heights of the footings and the approaches of bridges. Uh, if you talk to an engineer about these 144 bridges that the district council have to create, it's significant cost escalation in those footing heights and those approaches. And this is where this work around this LIDAR work and about, you can say, you know, working together with other councils and what we plan to do with uh, our wetlands, slowing down the water in the upper catchments, all these sorts of things can have an effect 
that we all share the same rate payer. I don't want them to be paying twice or three times for mitigations that aren't needed. You know what I mean? So it's a it's going to be a discussion that we're going to have to have with everybody. Uh, that's good. Uh, no, good points taken. Um, if nobody's getting through the questions, if, can someone move to note the re report? Right. Everyone will second it. Peter, all in favour say aye. Aye. Against, carry. On to item five, contracts and progress on works. So you Randall again. Hey, Mr. Chairman, take the report as read. I don't have any staff updates to, uh, to what's on the agenda. Um, I think it's worth noting that the staff and contractors should be commended for their efforts in delivering this work program under some pretty challenging times. Welcome, any questions? No questions, uh, Lloyd? Just one, like, my, my view is we had a very good operational season, so take the COVID out because most truck drivers drive by the trucks by themselves so people don't contact them. Is there any outstanding work that we didn't get done? Because I assume by this list we got a lot of stuff done with a very um, favourable season in our favour. Uh, so through the Chair, I don't have an update on uh, what's left outstanding. I do believe that we're coming very close to the end of delivering the work programme as I understand it. Yeah, I think there is a culvert left to be done in one of the uh, Tiana catchments. I think there's probably one of the big ticket yeah. items left to be delivered. Perhaps, um, for you, Chair, um, perhaps if there is a, if there is an update that you know, we can confirm this through, through, through the Chair if there's any significant outstanding items. Yeah, I think I probably have a view, Mr. Chairman, that we, we've had a good catch up here for a lot of stuff. If we had a mediocre year, we would be behind the mark. So it's about how we manage the seasonal variations of a work program that is very reliant on weather. And this season worked in their favour. I don't know, that's good. If we've got no more questions, can someone Happy to move the move that, Nicole, and uh, someone to second it? I can, Lord. All in favour say aye. Against Gary, right. On to item six, probably working party. So obviously got the minutes of the probably working party. I take it people have read that. And uh, if we can note it if anybody or who wants to move that. I'm happy to move it, Mr. Chairman. My yeah. comments earlier in the meeting related to um, item six in this report when I go through the um return of white pine trust update. So that's what I was referring to. Yeah. So um, I'm happy to move this. Uh, second it. Nickel. Thank you. Is anybody other questions or anything? We're all good with that. Yeah, I, uh, I, I just want to say yeah. through you, just like um, there is a, uh, in this part of the, maybe Jane, you can guide me at the part. Page 38. Page 38. It spoke of uh, a, a photograph that was recorded as a, a photograph of ES land. Um, that, that, that was incorrect. That wasn't a photograph of ES land, so it may pay to make a note on the, on the minutes just to reflect that. That, that okay. was incorrectly recorded. What well, are the is there minutes to put back to the next property working party? We'll add a footnote in just to identify that it wasn't ES land. Okay. No. Oh, the owner of content me about that. I have seen the photo. I know it's in the lower Matera, as I understand it, but I never, I'm not sure whether she's actually found the photo and identified the property, but I thought that had been done. So I, I was just advised that it wasn't, you know, there was a conversation that it was a part of the S land. It's, it's not whether no, well, there was the expectation yeah. in the report yeah. coming through. Yeah, yeah. that's truly noted. So apart from that, I think we note that, but um, with that, uh, yeah. I'll be yeah. happy to move uh, there. Yeah. Uh, as always, you get the finger pointed at us quite a bit. It's good to clarify those things. Um, okay, well, we just got, did you move that, Lloyd? Well, I'm, I'm just wondering now, we, if Jan's raised it, if we have to make an amendment, do we move it apart from that section, or how do we? Moving the minutes as such. We're to note the minutes. No, just noting yeah, these minutes. We're noting the minutes. Yeah. Second, Nicole. No discussion. We've had a bit. All in favour, say aye. 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 A
against carry. Right, we'll move on to item. We'll get we item seven, but we're going to public exclude it. Is that correct? Yep. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. Yes, we are. If we can. Can we? We're going. We're not. Oh, actually, sorry. Sorry. No, sorry. Uh, item 10. Yeah, we, we go into item 7. We've got to go into. Yeah, Kevin. Yeah, Kevin. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. We go straight to that. We go to Kevin. Kevin, yeah. Maybe we'll do that. Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. Um, Kevin, item 10. Oops, I've lost you on the screen now. Here it is. Yep. Uh, uh, folks, can you hear me okay? Yeah, yep, very good. Uh, well, well, and, well, um, yeah. My connection. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Apologies in advance. My connection's been really bad through the meeting, so I may end up sounding a little bit like Darth Vader, um, but uh, I'll try my best. <laughs> um, so firstly, apologies from um, Phil Melgren. He wasn't able to attend, um, so I've jumped in to cover um, on short notice. So I'll do my best to cover the areas of interest that you guys have got, um, and I've, I've made a few guesses as to what might be appropriate, um, but please let me know if uh, it's a little bit off track. I'm happy to um, adapt as I go. But um, just to tell you a little bit about myself, um, Kev Carter, I'm the Biodiversity Ranger um, responsible for the Rakiura National Park. Um, so I've got uh, quite a, a local focus here on Rakiura, Stewart Island. Um, I've lived here for about six years, um, so yeah, um, Nowhere near being a local, but um, but definitely love the island. Um, have a wife and a small child, a small daughter here is about to start school. So, yeah, we're very, very passionate about the island. We love living in Southland. Um, and, yeah, we're lucky enough to work in conservation as well. So um, that's a little bit about me. Um, but, hey, um, in terms of what I wanted to cover today, just as a bit of a, um, bit of a guess, is um, a couple of strategic, uh, sort of frameworks that have been developing um, and uh, ready for implementation in DOC. So um, that might help uh, explain how we might interact with Environment South Fund um, on various various areas of work as well. But um, I suppose probably to start at the top, um, as you'll know, in April, we had the launch of the Tamana or Te Tau or um, Aotearoa New Zealand Biodiversity Strategy. Um, that's a 30 year strategic document um, uh, from 2020 through to 2050. And um, the implementation plan is um, a document that uh, creates a series of um, steps to uh, achieve the goal. So um, there's five major outcomes um, and we've got 13 objectives that are covered in three main groups and 54 goals overall. Um, obviously, that's a very broad document covering the environmental sector. So um, DOCS, one player, and um, you know, it's a, a range of other agencies are captured under that strategy as well, including NPI, Ministry for Environment, and so on. Um, the next sort of layer we've got is a organizational um, strategy re <laughs> rework, I guess. So we've um, uh, Penny Nelson started as our new director general um, recently, and she's spent some time um, having a look at the department's strategic frameworks and you know how that flows onto the work that happens out in the districts um, and around the country. And um, sorry, my computer's just locked itself. She. Um, she came up with 10 key areas, and I'll just um, lock my computer, <laughs> sorry, team, um, that she really wanted to focus on in year one. Um, and that's, this is going to be something that's going to really drive um, resource allocation, strategic direction, um, uh, and, you know, from this year forward. Um, and it's got about a five year focus. Um, so. The 10, the 10 areas um, or the 10 priorities that the new DG or Director General has got um, starts with a well-supported frontline. Um, so we're thinking about staff out in the regions, out in local offices, staff like myself, 
um, been really well supported by organisational, um, I guess, support layers, uh, teams based nationally um, that can help support work hopefully as well. Um, the second key area she wants to focus on is um, moving the department's work focus back onto PCL or public conservation land. Um, so having more of a focus on that as well, um, where our core mandates are and um, uh, you know the land that we're responsible for administering. Um, climate change is obviously a key focus as um, was raised earlier in the meeting. And uh, we're looking at ways to reduce carbon um, and manage other effects of climate change as well. So at a practical level that uh, carbon budgeting is gonna um, uh, require some innovative solutions in terms of accessing remote areas of land, um, the different tools that we use um, for achieving conservation work. Um, and so it's great you know, to work in with Environment Southland to uh, um, increase and maximize the efficiency of things like helicopter trips or boat trips, et cetera, et cetera. And it was cool to see the Southern winds uh, in some of the presentations there as well. So um, yeah, that's, that's a definite focus um, for the department in the next uh, few years as well uh, and an ongoing focus. Um, so the fourth one is um, the right system settings. Um, so this is just really around um, a conservation law reform, um, having a look at what we can do in the way of management planning, um, amendments to the Wildlife Act, et cetera, just to make those a little bit more fit for purpose. Um, some of those acts are 50, 70 years old. So um, yeah, just looking to bring those up to date and, and fit for purpose with um, current needs. Um, a stronger treaty partnership. So this has um, always been a key focus for the department, but we're looking to place even more emphasis on this uh, in the next year um, and, the next, you know, and obviously ongoing as well. Um, and this is really around how do we make things um, real on the ground? How do we operationalize, um, you know, statements of intent uh, and, and make, um, I guess, make some practical um, opportunities available um, to, to strengthen um, our treaty partnerships and, and really give effect to um, the Treaty of Waitangi. Um, we've got one called Great Experiences. So this is just around the tourism um, focus of DOC. So um, working on our infrastructure to make sure that um, visitor safety risks are um, addressed uh, appropriately and um, and quickly as well, um, and just improving the visitor um, asset infrastructure. So tracks, huts, campgrounds, um, yeah, and um, across for a range of different experiences. So everything from, you know, really easy short walks that you can do in 20 minutes to backcountry adventures out in the middle of nowhere. Um, Partnering for conservation, so this is obviously a, a core ethos for the department, um, and this is around how we work with others um, and our collaborative conservation focus. So um, I guess the two key areas there are really around jobs for nature uh, and pretty free 2050, um, and at a more regional level here in Southland, um, you know, supporting uh, pretty free Southland, pretty free Rakiura, um, and the range of conservation partners. So um, with the Rakiura one, because that's um, something close to my heart and something I know a little bit more about um, being based on the island. Uh, yeah, um, we've got a role to play similar to yourselves um, with the engagement and advisory group um, that uh, advises the Te Puka Rakiura Trust. Um, so we'll see you guys there. Um, <laughs> We've got one about um, people feeling valued. So this is just around um, internal um, staffing and um, how we can make sure that we maintain staff morale, um, make sure people feel valued in their professional roles um, with the organisation. Um, excellent financial and asset management. So um, there's actually a new... Uh, I guess a program of work um, being rolled out, something called Te Tatai Atafai or Doc Best Practice. 
um, and it's around implementing a system of um, an electronic system based on SAP, um, and that's going to streamline our procurement processes, um, asset management, budget management, and reporting. Um, so just sort of integrating the, the broad areas of doc work um, electronically. So that'll drive planning and um, and program management as well. So um, yeah, that's going to be quite an exciting change for us. Um, and then of course, monitoring, measuring and evaluation. So um, this is around how we how we're tracking on the um, New Zealand biodiversity strategy um, and also um, this internal strategy. Um, so I guess just moving down the down the layers, getting more specific, getting more local. Um, uh, we I just wanted to touch on um, the fact that we're going through our annual um, business planning processes at the moment. So we'll be looking to determine what um, the priority areas of work are over the next four years and allocating resources accordingly. So um, this will uh, be the, I guess, the foundation or the basis of um, what work we're able to, which projects are going to be funded, where we're engaging, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, um, that's underway at the moment and closely tied in with the government budget um, timeline as well. Um, why did I want to go have a chat on that? Um, yeah, and um, I guess just locally, um, I can talk a little bit more about Rakiura and the work that Doc's doing here. Um, so obviously, um, we do a lot of work with Environment Southland through the Regional Case Management Plan and the um, site lead plan for Rakiura. Um, so that's great in terms of um, completing the range. I think there's about 11 weed or pest plant species that are managed through Oban. Um, and that's a really valuable partnership that we have with you. Um, and quite exciting because the a lot of those weed species that have been identified uh, are actually close to um, eradication or even containment. So um, uh, for instance, things like Old Man's Beard is, is practically non-existent on the island and we've got a realistic chance of, of eradication. So. Um, yeah, over the season, our staff have been um, completing that plan um, and we can enter support uh, and receiving support from some of your field staff uh, working on things like the Gunra uh, control program here in Rakiota. Um, we're also working in closely with some of the local community groups um, like Mamaku Point Conservation Trust and um, SUSID or the Stuart Island Rakiota Community and Environment Trust. Um, SUSID have, as you probably aware received the large um, Jobs for Nature funding um, package. So um, we're working really closely with them to um, design the strategy for how that's going to be implemented and then assisting with um, implementation as well. Um, so it's a two-year program, uh, they're well into it and it's got a major focus on um, supporting the site-led plan for Rakiura. So they're doing a lot of Darwin's Farbury control um, they've got a huge uh, staffing resource available. Um, so this is probably the best position that um, the Darwin's Barbary Control Program has ever been in. And um, we're ho hoping to maximize those gains that are made over the next two years. So um, when the Jobs for Nature funding wraps up, um, we're looking at how we can um, uh, secure funding and, and keep up the momentum that, that um, Jobs for Nature is generated there. Um, it's also got a predator control aspect to it as well. So as you're probably aware, um, this group have been working out on the Hexpoint Point Peninsula um, for about 20 odd years. And um, yeah, they're now with Jobs for Nature funding, uh, looking to expand that area from 210 hectares up to 1,200 hectares uh, throughout the urban township. Um, and we're quite excited about that because it's going to set up um, the basic sort of infrastructure uh, tracks, um, traps, um, you know, psyllium re remote um, trap reporting uh, communication sort of systems. Um, and even after Jobs for Nature wraps it up as a program, you know, this infrastructure is still going to be in place. 
um, and that could um, prove really useful for predator-free rock uh, in terms of managing re-incursions, etc. So um, yeah, that's um, that's another big part of our week um, and um, quite a quite a cool one as well. Um, but yeah, hey, look, that, that's just sort of what I prepared off the top of my head. I mean, um, I'm really happy to talk to anything else if um, if you guys have got any other areas of interest. Um, I might not be able to answer everything because I do have quite a local um, local focus and, and mandate. Um, but if I can't answer anything, I'm happy to forward it on to the right person as well. So yeah, really happy to take questions. Thanks. Yep. No, thanks, Kevin. That was uh, that's good. Good uh, round round up of what's uh, going on down your way. Um, Peter and then Nickel got a couple of questions. Yeah, thanks for that, Kevin. You probably can't see me because I'm not logged into the Zoom, but um, Docs found it hard too with their budgeting. You know, I know this council's lost a huge amount of revenue with the cruise ship, marine fee, and Doc with their concessions. Amount of revenue they've lost, so I understand that you're trying to make everything fit. And yeah, the new director general Penny, she's come in from another area outside conservation. And one of her first comments I heard was she couldn't believe the width of work that DOC staff do, um, and probably looking to tighten that up over time. But um, just at a local issue over on the island, what about deer? Do you want to? Do you feel comfortable talking about whitetail deer? incursions into the township, there seems to be quite uh, a different view from who you talk to, whether there needs to be uh, further control or not. Any comment on that, Kevin? Sorry to throw you in the hot seat there. Oh, no, that's fine. Um, no, deer are definitely a hot topic uh, on the island. And um, uh, I suppose we're really talking about whitetails in the urban township as the, um, I guess, ground zero for that debate. And it is a polarizing debate. You know, people generally fall into one of two camps. Um, some people see them as a conservation pest and uh, are concerned about impacts on forest health. Um, and other people see them as a convenient and valuable hunting resource. Um, I suppose there's a third group as well that um, overlap with the, the hunting um, interest groups. Uh, which is that you know they're interested in wildlife and um, and a valued part of the, the local system just because you know they're a large mammal and um, add diversity to the to the local landscape. So um so that's kind of the I guess the spread of local opinion. Um, the department has been approached by the people who are concerned about the impacts of deer on the forest. Um, and also people that are concerned about the impact of deer on their personal properties. Um, sometimes it's down to vegetable gardens, um, you know, and, and property values, et cetera. So um, yeah, what um, there's, a, there's a piece of work um, being led nationally by a chap called Dave Carlton, who used to, some of you may remember, used to work down here. Uh, it's called Deer in Aotearoa, and it's got a particular focus on um, deer in fringe areas, so either forest farmland fringes or forest urban fringes. And he was quite, uh, when we approached him to, you know, discuss the deer topic for urban, he was quite interested in adding that, um, the site to his project. And so what, what his project would involve would be um, approaching the community, having some, you know, community meetings, um, trying to canvas opinion, trying to open up that social discussion around what do people actually want um, and then using that as the basis for uh, any sort of future control work, et cetera. So I guess um, from our point of view, it's got to be something that is supported by the community. Um, and if and if that happens, um, then we'll be in a position to, um, to support practically, you know, with either technical advice or undertaking deer control, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that, that's just really around the, the township and the private land on Rakhuda. Um, that, that's probably about as much as I could say. Um, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, it does, Kevin. It's just that there's some people that are quite suspicious around predator-free Rakhuda and deer control 
merging into one project, um, there is a large, you know, we've got to keep that separate. Okay. Yeah, and and um, my understanding of British Free Rakhira is that they're very, very clear that they aren't in scope um, as far as they're concerned. They're really only looking at feral cats, hedgehogs, possums, and three species of rat. So, um, yeah, and we need to reinforce that to make sure that people don't get confused. Good. Uh, Nicole, you've got a right. question. Um, yeah, thanks for the update, Kev. Um, one issue close to my heart that I raised with Minister Allen recently was, and you're talking about four-year plans, I suggested if you could use Southland as a pilot to um, have some contestable funding for um, for pl native planting on the what we used to call the Queen's Chain, but uh, the dock is quite a large landowner in Southland, and it would tick the boxes of um, yeah, privilege of free biodiversity, increasing improving water quality. Uh, carbon sequestration, and actually sticking to the uh, the good neighbour neighbor, um, policy that has come in over the last few years. I know your budgets are a little stretched, but I, I think uh, that sort of funding would be a great PR exercise and actually help uh, help the region actually um, achieve multiple goals. Uh, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, sorry, I missed the first part, my connection's really bad, but you were talking about a, a specific funding stream. Do, do you mind repeating that, please? I, I was speaking, we had Minister Allen um, down here recently, and it was a, an issue I raised with her uh, at that level. So I'm just, when you're talking about budgets, I just thought I'd throw it in there. It's, uh, I know you're prioritising, but um, it's an area we believe could be a great partnership. No, absolutely, and uh, I encourage um, you know anyone in Environment Southland or or um, any of your constituents to uh, contact the department. You know, and so um, we're really interested in these projects. Um, we think it would be great to support these initiatives, and um, yeah, just just communicate with us, and we can. Uh, part of the funding prioritisation is is looking at those partnerships, looking at um, community aspirations, regional aspirations, and working in with our agency partners as well. So, um, yeah, absolutely, just just keep talking to us, and um, hopefully that can be reflected in how the resources are allocated. Thanks, Matt. Uh, so good. You got any other questions? Uh, look, that's good. Thanks, uh, Keith, for. Um, Give us a bit of a verbal update. What's going on? It's always uh, it's always quite enjoyable to hear what Doc's up to, and we're always happy to uh, spend some of your money too. So don't don't be afraid to let it go um, around the community. <laughs> but uh, no, no, that's all good. And uh, thanks, thanks for coming in today. So all the best. Right. Thank you very much. I'll move to receive that thread. What? Someone second that. Neville. Mm -hmm. All in favour, say aye. Aye. Against carried. Uh, moving on to 11, we don't seem to have any extraordinary urgent business. We move into public excluded if we can have reasons for that. Uh, yep, to enable any local authority holding the information to carry out without prejudice or disadvantage commercial activities and to protect the privacy of natural persons, including that of deceased natural persons. Good, can I have someone move it? Second it, Lloyd, Nicole. 